So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Salvatore, for the introduction and for inviting me here to give this talk. Today, uh, as uh, the chairman uh, said, I have a double hat, so I'm here partly as a researcher of CNR in the first part, but then most of my talk will be on uh, uh, the transfer of uh, nanotechnology to industry through a spin-off company, Scriba Nanotechnology. So one interest of uh, many of us uh, is uh, in the use uh, and exploitation of multifunctional materials. These uh, can be materials uh, uh, designed chemically or generated by physical processes, which uh, are endowed with uh, uh, one or more uh, properties of interest uh, for devices or functional systems. For instance, uh, uh, charge transfer, as in the case uh, of organic semiconductors, uh, or uh, uh, conductivity or mechanical properties, as in the case of nanotubes. There are also many other materials that uh, are available now, also in a large amount, like uh, clusters uh, and nanoparticles that could be used uh, for a variety of uh, scopes uh, from uh, Electro, for instance, uh, electroluminescent uh, uh, displays, uh, photovoltaics, uh, uh, biosensing, and so on and so forth. Or simply, uh, for instance, print printable electronics. Okay, so uh, one thing we would like to do is uh, somehow to take these materials that often are not very keen to be processed, uh, process them, but not only make uh, thin films out of them, but especially uh, position them at uh, the right uh, spots uh, on uh, desired uh, substrates uh, and integrate them in such a way that we can make uh, a device or we can somehow address the function that uh, they are endowed with. So this is uh, the uh, scope of uh, our research and the uh, here is uh, how our uh, research is structured, uh, is illustrated uh, in, into this kind of uh, uh, part. We study the self-organization and growth uh, uh, phenomena that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, are present or can be exploited for these materials, and then we uh, use them as the basis for the nanofabrication of the material. So in this way, we have the control across the land scales, the, as uh, Salvatore was mentioning before. Then, uh, as a final uh, test, we uh, make a device uh, out of it. And uh, as we were developing this type of activity in the years, we have uh, gathered a sizable number of patents uh, that uh, have uh, been eventually placed uh, into the spin-off company, Scriba Nanotechnology, mostly driven by the fact that the patents were becoming very, very expensive at the time. So th this is a, a, a good reason. When a research center produces patents in a genuine way, not just uh, to enrich the curriculum at some point, uh, you need to uh, do something like this. It is very difficult nowadays to sell the patent directly. And uh, so the best uh, way, the most convincing way also for investors is really to make a, a spin-off that could really develop uh, the idea and the <coughs> The, uh, the invention into a, a real product. And similarly now we have moved uh, from uh, this area more towards uh, the integration of biosystems uh, with the multifunctional materials, uh, uh, trying to, de to develop new types of biosensors based on organic field effect transistors and uh, uh, also to manufacture patterns for cell and tissue growth. And out of this we are making, we made uh, recently a new spin-off called nano for bio so the patterning technology that uh, we are using is uh, mostly based on unconventional approaches. We have uh, a large use of soft lithography, uh, the kind of techniques uh, developed by George Whiteside in the past. Uh, here is shown an example with uh, MIMIC, which is a well-known uh, technique. MIMIC uh, means uh, micromolding capillaries, uh, and uh, as you can see, it consists of uh, making a stamp uh, uh, sealing the stamp uh, on a substrate uh, in filling the, the stamp and then after the solvent is gone uh, by lifting uh, the stamp away, one is left uh, with the pattern of the 
or the microchannels. Uh, there is a technique that we have developed uh, our own uh, a few years ago in uh, the lab. We term it uh, lithographically controlled wetting, and it exploits uh, capillary forces, uh, which uh, sets in between uh, a stamp uh, and the substrate when the stamp is brought uh, uh, close to the substrate, but not in contact. Uh, so the substrate is floating on top of a, a liquid layer containing uh, a solute. The solute is the material of uh, our interest. And by capillary forces, there is the confinement of the solution under the protrusions. So this uh, makes uh, two effects. First of all, it uh, in fact makes dry areas in between the protrusions uh, and uh, all the solution is here. And then uh, forces the solute to self-organize in a, a space which has a lateral confinement. And this uh, leads uh, to an enhancement of uh, order. For instance, uh, uh, you, you get uh, crystallization uh, very easily and very quickly. Or you can uh, also have different types of phenomena, like ripening, de-wetting, and so on, that uh, intrinsically possess uh, land scales that uh, you can control. And what is nice is that although these uh, protrusions can be also a uh, few hundred nanometers wide, the structures that uh, you can obtain uh, if you tune properly the uh, process are much uh, smaller than the uh, size itself. So th this uh, technique uh, yields uh, uh, features uh, which are uh, downscaled with respect to the original stamp, so it's not a transfer one to one. Here I want to show some examples of uh, the nano patterning. Pretty much you can pattern anything which is soluble or can be dispersed dispersed in a solution, also uh, with uh, uh, colloidal uh, uh, suspensions. Uh, so one can uh, actually fabricate uh, dots, so zero-dimensional structures, uh, dot arrays uh, like this, uh, can uh, fabricate st lines, uh, stripes. For instance, these stripes are just uh, two monolayer high and uh, highly ordered, highly crystalline. One can pattern uh, uh, polymers which are barely soluble, like uh, polyaniline, for instance, uh, large uh, polyanions like DNA, or nanotubes that, as you know, are very difficult uh, to, to pattern uh, starting from the suits. And one can obtain, in fact, uh, so dots, uh, one-dimensional uh, structures, uh, also into arrays, or uh, systems like these uh, membranes, uh, which is uh, something in between a two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Three so uh, uh, the technique is quite versatile. has been uh, widely used uh, for publishing uh, nice papers. And uh, as an example, I want to show you the construction of a complete device uh, based on an ad additive manufacturing approach. So we just put the amount of material that we need for the construction of the device. So with a double step, which is a mimic step, we fill the stamp, a stamp uh, with a, a precursor made of platinum carbonyl clusters. We produce uh, uh, lines of platinum carbonyl. Uh, finger, these are fingers. Then uh, we heat it and we transform it into platinum. So platinum fingers. And then uh, uh, we put the stamp 90 degrees across. We infill it with a solution of uh, an organic semiconductor. And then uh, we fabricate uh, lines uh, connecting the fingers. So the uh, device works, uh, as you can see here, in the output characteristics, just uh, through these uh, uh, fingers of organic semiconductor. Here you see the source, you see the drain, and this uh, Lines uh, here are the, uh, line, the fingers uh, of P3HT. Okay, and uh, the nice result is that uh, the charge mobility is much uh, more improved with respect to spin cast uh, uh, organic semiconductor film. So <coughs> today I don't want to talk really about uh, electronics. Uh, I rather focus on uh, a problem which uh, was also addressed before, which is uh, information storage. Uh, here you will see examples of uh, they say warm uh, type of memories, uh, so fabrication of right ones, uh, read many times uh, memories uh, on uh, uh, polymeric films. So we want to encode an information on a flexible substrate, uh, <coughs> and we can do this uh, in a variety of way, either integrating a material which has a function that can be read, or by uh, suitably modifying 
a conventional material in such a way that uh, we produce a contrast of property on the material. So here you see the example of uh, the integration of uh, a functional material into a polymer blend. Uh, the polymer is polycarbonate, and the approach is quite simple. One uh, makes uh, a, a blend uh, of uh, polycarbonate with the desired uh, material, and uh, by imprinting or replica molding, gives a structure to the, to the film, and then uh, uh, exposes the film to a solvent, or simply cures thermally the, the, uh, the film. So what happens is that these structures uh, disassemble, the surface smooth, uh, smooths uh, down, and uh, as uh, this, uh, let's say, polymer reorganization takes place, uh, there is a, a counter flow and the concentration of the solute in the correspondence of the protrusions. At the end of the process, if we stop at the right time, the result is that we concentrate at the surface the solute that we have dispersed in the molecular film. Here is an example where we have dispersed a manganese 12 cluster into the polymer film. This is the topography after the smoothing, so the topography now is very marginal. We started from a compact uh, DVD, which uh, had uh, this uh, type of topographic feature, so about 100 nanometer uh, height uh, uh, coding of, of the bits. We end up uh, after, after the, <coughs> the annealing uh, with a 4 nanometer peak-to-peak uh, -peak, uh, uh, topography. So it's, uh, can, it can be read uh, no longer optical, but only by FM. And uh, here you see the magnetic contrast that can be read with the magnetic tip. So what uh, we have done uh, effectively is we have copied, uh, uh, let's say, an optical disk into a magnetic uh, uh, support on a polymer film. Okay, other things we can do, for instance, is to place uh, a discotic liquid crystal, which is a, a molecule, a type of molecule which tends to organize in two columns on a surface, and then by means of a combined printing and annealing process, we can locally reorient the columns, either, <coughs> let's say, laying down with the molecules at John, or standing up, so homeotropic with respect to the surface. The result is that the molecules, which have the same molecular order but different orientation of the columns, exhibit B refringence, so a different optical response when uh, uh, they are observed in polarized light. The result uh, is uh, shown here, and wherever we add a hole in the stamp, like uh, here, we see that the molecules uh, remain oriented edge on, and they appear bright. So this is a way to encode, for instance, bits into a, a film made of these uh, liquid crystals. And what is the interest of this? Is the fact that uh, if now we heat uh, the, the film, at uh, a, a temperature which is above uh, the uh, rectangular columnar to uh, hexagonal columnar phase transition, which is a phase transition of these systems, then the bits uh, starts, the bits uh, disappear progressively. They disappear uh, either in time or every time we trespass uh, this uh, threshold. So we have a system which uh, starts to behave as a, a temperature recorder. As another example, uh, I show you here the uh, Cox uh, fractal. This is the famous snowflake. It's uh, generated by uh, taking a segment divided in three and adding a triangle. So every time we do this, we have a generation. And the contour length of the Cox fractal uh, <coughs> depends on the number of generations. The ratio between the two generations uh, uh, is a power law of a four third. And now here is an example of a fabricated fractal on a PMMA uh, film. This is part of a project called uh, STAG, which involves, in fact, also Basel. So the idea is now that a fractal, having a different length scale for the different generations, will somehow change the morphology at different uh, uh, times uh, for different temperatures. So there will be a, a, an irreversible morphological transition that we can monitor either in time or in temperature. Here is an example, the, the initial fractal heated at 130 degrees, 150, 170. You see a clear change with temperature. And if we measure 
the ratio, the contour length, after, at the end of the process, uh, with respect to the initial contour length, uh, this is uh, the scaling, we can extract uh, the, uh, the generation and uh, have then uh, the evolution in time for the different temperatures. So you clearly see that this is an activated process, and now we have pretty much a process by which we can measure how the uh, contour length of the pattern has changed and gives us uh, uh, an, an intertwined time temperature uh, measurement. So this is a system which potentially can be applied for a time temperature integrator. Other systems uh, that behave like that could be multi-layers, exploiting, for instance, wetting the wetting transition. So this is a, a time sequence uh, of a film on polypropylene, and uh, approaches like this are, in fact, developed in, com in uh, collaboration with uh, Lion del Basel, Giuseppe Ferrara will talk about uh, later. And also, in this case, we can, uh, for instance, uh, extract uh, the time uh, the process has taken place by measuring, for instance, the surface roughness or the correlation length. So the uh, idea for the exploitation is that the unstable films uh, can be uh, somehow controlled uh, either by changing the interaction of the, uh, the film with the substrate uh, or through the thickness, as it was mentioned also before, or through the viscosity. So by, by this, then, we can uh, somehow develop uh, a, a real system for monitoring uh, time and temperature. Uh, so this example I show here is the patterning of a, a polyolefin. This is uh, polyisobutylene, which is uh, irradiated with electrons. As uh, we irradiate with electrons, we uh, reduce the molecular weight locally. And uh, here you can see uh, the polymer film. This polymer film is something uh, that you find often in many chewing gums. It's a rubber, actually. And uh, <coughs> So here we, uh, we will uh, draw a marker, and uh, these areas will be radiated with different doses. So what happens, okay, here is the marker, it's barely visible, and then uh, we start uh, to expose at 60 degrees the, the film, and uh, as we expose, we see that uh, there is uh, a progressive change, an increased uh, de-wetting of the area with an increased uh, coverage uh, of these bright features. So we can measure Okay, this is uh, the final result, and uh, if we measure the evolution of the coverage in time, we observe that as a different uh, slope depending on the dose received, and uh, in this manner, okay, somehow we can uh, <coughs> extract uh, the uh, de-wetting velocity and tune our system for uh, the temperature range we would like to address. Okay, at this point, uh, uh, we see how this uh, knowledge uh, is transferred to industry. Uh, the spin-off company uh, we have funded in 2005 is uh, focused on uh, tags uh, which uh, can be read optically. These tags uh, must be used for traceability, anti-counterfeit uh, security, and identification. And uh, we have already a product uh, ready to market. We are now commercializing it in Japan. And this is a tag you see here. The tag that is fabricated is here at the center of this hologram. So it can be combined with a well-known standard technology, which is the holographic uh, uh, writing. It uh, can be read with a doc reader, or um, let's say we have also a setup that you attach to a Nokia N95 or other cell phones, uh, and you can read directly on uh, your screen. You can see also that it can be produced in rolls, so it's a real-to-real -real technology. And the idea is that we write pretty much a barcode, is a miniaturized barcode, is read and uh, translated into a text. So it's as simple as that, but it can, contains a, a lot of information, between 3 to 36 kilobyte information. And we have a version now that uh, can store also uh, images and multimedia uh, files. So if somebody is interested, uh, uh, this is ready. Now I want to just uh, to show instead uh, the translation of what I showed before into a new tag that we call T-tag, which pre uh, to summarize as the quality doesn't appear when uh, a product uh, is exposed to the right temperature, 
but when a, a threshold temperature is passed, it will appear a face like this, an inverted smile. So, so a tag which uh, is built completely on a polymer film, but has the functionality of recording the uh, temperature that uh, uh, the system was exposed to. So this is the initial tag. Now we go to 46 uh, degrees. The image is an optical image in dark field. And uh, now the temperature is slightly raised. And uh, say within a few degrees, sorry, we arrive to the final result, which is uh, the one that was uh, originally drawn. So uh, moving from, uh, say, from between 46 and 54 degrees, there is uh, uh, the appearance of this feature. Now, as an outlook, uh, uh, what I think uh, will be very interesting is to explore the possibility to pattern uh, uh, living um, uh, cells and tissues on uh, flexible polymer films. Of course, this is very important for uh, sensors. It's very important for regenerative medicine. Here are some attempts I want to show you. Uh, th these are membranes of carbon nanotubes on which uh, you can grow you can uh, seed and preferentially adhere uh, neurons. These are uh, neuroblastoma uh, cells. You can pattern uh, uh, titania into stripes and have cells uh, uh, ad uh, adhering only in these uh, regions. You see here some detail from SEM and AFM of the, of the cell sitting on the porous membrane. And you can pattern uh, uh, foils, which are di very difficult uh, to attach to cells, like Teflon, which uh, is also technologically very important. Uh, these are stripes of uh, laminin pattern of on Teflon. These uh, are cells at the initial stage of seeding. And then, in time, they uh, get to confluence only in the pattern regions. So this is, uh, again, another example with neuroblastoma. And uh, here is an example where you can also uh, see the possibility to direct uh, somehow the motion of cells like fibroblast along uh, lines that uh, one has uh, patterned. Okay, with this, uh, I want to conclude. And uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, unconventional patterning is suitable to integrate materials uh, with a function into different substrates, including polymeric films, uh, can be used for high density information storage, uh, and uh, so achieve, uh, uh, for instance, polymeric films for packaging with some uh, uh, extra functionality. A time temperature integrator can be uh, achieved also, let's say, monolithically integrated into the same film, and uh, I showed the perspectives uh, in the field of uh, 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 biomedicine, especially regenerative medicine. I want to acknowledge the projects, especially the project uh, STAG that uh, gives us funding and uh, the project DSTEF from uh, MUR. The collaborations with industry are important, uh, as I showed. I want to acknowledge, in fact, uh, the collaboration with Basel that is ongoing right now. People on my group uh, who work with me are shown here, especially I want to thank Massimiliano Cavallini for a uh, large amount of the patterning activity and Francesco Valle and, uh, for uh, the activity on cells. And finally, the people of Scrib, especially Cino Matacotta, who has led uh, Scrib in a very few years uh, to the commercialization of, uh, let's say, a research idea just uh, started in 2005. So thank you again for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, the paper is open for questions. A uh, couple of questions ca we can still handle. Are there any comments or questions? Um, I, I was wondering, just as a curiosity, uh, of course you have been using different materials, different molecules for these different functionalities that, that you have been explored. Is there any chance to, to to mix up, to have more, at the same time, more than one of the things you have observed in the same system. So you mean, for instance, uh, the a, a transistor which duets? For example. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. You can have a transistor which works until uh, 
the stripes are uh, stripes, and then uh, mm -hmm. it will not work anymore in the moment it duets, and uh, there's no longer continuity. Yeah, they, of course. Yes, yeah. that is uh, uh, doable. The uh, difficulty in the case of uh, electronics is the realignment, yeah. but uh, we are perfectly able right now to integrate, let's say, discrete devices uh, in, uh, on polymer foils problem is uh, to make, uh, let's say, kilometers of polymer foils. Mm -hmm. More questions? Uh, I have another small curiosity, <laughs> just yes. to keep people alive, but uh, how competitive is it, the, 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 the gadget you have prepared uh, for the tagging of, uh, I mean, there are several approaches, and some of them are already on the market. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, okay, compared to a RFID, yeah. uh, the competitivity, uh, okay, I don't think they are directly in competition uh, for many reasons. Uh, but first of all, price. Price of this each uh, centimeter square is 0.01 cent per centimeter square. Right now, I think uh, RFID are on the order of 10 cents. Yeah. Second is amount of information. Here is, uh, let's say, uh, quite large. And the third, uh, I would say, uh, relates uh, to the readout. Uh, if you want, uh, say, distance readout, but, uh, say, possible, uh, uh, or, uh, say, Distance, uh, RFID is good for di dis uh, readout at distance. Uh, however, has some problems uh, re okay. related to the field and related also to the privacy. Yeah. Okay. The the, the, these ones uh, have the same uh, type of uh, uh, level of privacy as uh, any barcode system. Yeah. So, okay. But thi this does not contain a code, it contains uh, eventually. Say uh, all wealth of uh, information, so it could be useful maybe more than for tomato cans uh, for uh, identification uh, and security. Mm. Did you find any way to make a, a sad face turning into a smiling face? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you again. Not yet. Thank you.